The first images that come to mind at the thought of Victorian asylums are gruesome depictions of dingy dungeons holding raving lunatics in severe restraints, tended by doctors of suspect moral and mental capacities. Today's mental health facilities elicit a sigh of relief compared to those gloomy illustrations. However, the Victorian era forged considerable asylum reforms. Wrongfully committed individuals who became inconvenient to their families stood as key figures in the progression of mental health institutions. These institutions became less and less like prisons, favoring instead an inviting, home-like environment. Bethlehem Royal Hospital, famously nicknamed Bedlam, earned a reputation for ill treatment of the insane. First established in 1247, the institution welcomed sightseers who regarded patients as an entertaining spectacle. Here, they saw a chaotic madhouse where inmates were subjected to beatings, kept in shackles, and confined in cold, filthy cells. Some of this harshness can be attributed to late medieval perceptions of insanity as a penalty devised by God, a purgatory on earth. Not surprisingly then, treatment in Bethlehem was conducted more in a spirit of punishment rather than healing. However, by the 18th century, shifts in cultural values and the increased need for asylums began a push for more humane living conditions. While some treatments, like isolation and cold water hydrotherapy, persisted through the century, other old traditional treatments, like restraint and painful purges, vomits, and bleedings, diminished during the latter part of the century. The rebuilt Bethlehem of the 1670s boasted large windows, and visitors described the rooms as spacious and bright, its galleries as thoroughly well lit and its fine gardens as places where patients enjoy fresh air and recreate themselves amongst trees, flowers, and plants. The major push for reform came not from men in positions of power, but rather from the wrongfully committed. Sane men and women confined to asylums by treacherous family members who sought to control the victim's finances. Cases of false incarceration struck fear into the hearts of Victorian England, contributing to what is later to be known as the lunacy panics of the 1850s. The protocol for asylum incarceration in the 1830s could be readily abused through conflicts of interest, cursory oversight, and limited appeals. The Victorians concentrated their efforts on passing a series of laws designed to create more rigorous standards for diagnosing mental illness, meriting removal to an asylum. However, the victims of wrongful confinement were also persuasive witnesses testifying to conditions within asylums. These men and women were generally members of the middle and upper levels of society, meaning they were literate, often influential, and they were angry. Through mediums such as public speaking and the popular press, they garnered enough support to initiate reform. In 1838, Richard Paternoster became a victim of false incarceration after a lunacy order was sent out by his greedy father who refused to relinquish his son's pension. Paternoster was captured in his lodgings and forcibly removed to Marlborough Street Magistrates Court. His gentlemanly appearance and wit caught the journalists' attention. They took up his cause, and the Times published his first-hand account of the asylum conditions. Paternoster re was released after 41 days, gratefully attributing his swift release to the blessings of the free press. He detailed his experiences in his book, The Madhouse System, writing of the physical, verbal, and sometimes sexual abuse of patients. Paternoster's well-publicized experiences stirred further energy towards ending wrongful confinement. Twenty years later, the case of Lady Bulwer-Lytton built upon the momentum initiated by Richard Paternoster. Lady Lytton 
wife of statesman and celebrated novelist Sir Edward Bulwer Lytton, is one such figure. When their marriage fell into acrimonious dispute and separation, Lord Lytton arranged for a doctor to declare his troublesome wife insane and forcibly remove her to White House Asylum. Although the asylum purportedly treated its inmates as house guests, Lady Lytton was confined to her room and later stated that, in the absence of liberty, a palace will nevertheless become a dungeon. Given her social prominence, her story became sensationalized within the papers. For example, the Somerset County Gazette committed whole pages to Lady Lytton's plight. One sympathizer penned a 12 stanza poem describing that Lytton's wrongs claim sympathy, wrongs cruel, poignant, deep, and that the oppression of her freedom, the delight of humankind, was worse than a life as a slave. One pamphlet boasted an illustration of Lytton incarcerated in a small, dim room decorated with human skeletons. Lady Lytton's story spread to national newspapers, gaining her additional allies and eventually her freedom. Once more, the press carried a key role in bringing the issue of wrongful confinement and the conditions of asylums to public attention. As a result of the mid-century lunacy panics, six bills were passed to preserve the liberty of sane men and women. Furthermore, institutions were subjected to more careful monitoring to ensure the release of people who were either healed or wrongfully incarcerated. This move towards more consistent and comprehensive monitoring of activity within asylums contributed to a significant reform in the conceptions of the asylum. Not a prison or a theater as in the days of early Bedlam, but a structure designed to emulate the middle and upper class home. Holloway Sanatorium, opened in 1885, illustrates this shift in the English perception of asylum care. In contrast to asylums such as the Bethlehem of 1815, the Holloway Sanatorium is beautifully modeled in the French Gothic style, designed and decorated to provide cheerfulness and distraction for troubled minds. Consequently, Thomas Holloway and his like-minded contemporaries preferred environments that disguise the institutional nature of an asylum. Holloway stated that cold and gray columns and walls, even if enlivened by sculpture, would sit heavily on a mind diseased. Similarly, the grounds were landscaped to be comfortable and civilized, to lift the spirits and distract patients from any melancholic thoughts or associations. Nature became a healing agent, one of the integral parts of the road to recovery. Holloway, like others charged with caring for the mentally ill, began adopting the belief that these individuals could be healed and restored to society. Many of the Victorian treatments began a shift towards a moral treatment, where patients were encouraged to pursue activities of domestic duties, such as needlework, piano, dancing, gardening, painting, or pursuing academics. One way Holloway ensured that their patients received this treatment was through the hiring of living companions. These men and women were hired to restore behavioral and social normality through companionship. Moral therapy aimed to cure the middle class insane and teach them the proper social behavior that would help them rehabilitate into the outside world. Finally, mid-Victorian Christianity emphasized self-reflection and self-discipline. If the inmates of late medieval Bethlehem were regarded as the subjects of God's punitive focus, inmates in institutions like Holloway were credited with participating in their own recovery through habits of moral reflection and self-discipline. A salient illustration in the decline of the use of physical restraints, patients were encouraged to metaphorically restrain themselves and thus master their illness. From the dingy dungeons of Bethlehem to the domestic domicile of Holloway, the evolution of mental health policies came to the forefront of English society's mind in the Victorian era. The unfortunate victims of wrongful confinement became prime witnesses and agents of change for laws regarding diagnosis and incarceration, as well as the standards of living within asylums. 
As a result of their words and actions, individuals who could be legitimately diagnosed with mental illness experienced conditions designed to mimic the comforts and routine of home. We have seen a movement through the century beginning with the harshness of Bethlehem's treatments and the living conditions to moving towards Holloway's home-like environment and desire to cure their patients. The changes are remarkable and may not have happened without the testimonies of those who not only endured their wrongful confinement, but spoke out against their attackers and the flawed system that had allowed it to happen.